I may have bit off more than I could chew today. <laughs> I I think I did actually. That's not a very confident start, Mike. I guess I've been a dummy dum dum, and now I'm going to become a skeptic like you. And we can we can we can take over the internet with our atheism or something like that. This is an unexpected turn of events. Let's look at it in more detail without cartoon images. <laughs> without cartoons, that's a burn on you, Paul. On me. Take a look at yourself, Brady. Well. I guess there, but by the grace of God went I. And I decided to do it as a first question today, which may have been a mistake. Probably was a mistake. Definitely was a mistake. All right. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. Or today, two former Christians taking a look at the complaints of a Christian about the claims of Satan. Because today I'm joined by founding member of the Grammy-nominated Christian rap group, The Cross Movement. It started in a garden where hearts got hardened. We fell into a deep sleep and just kept falling. Some know him as Fanatic, but I know him as Brady Goodwin fellow ex-Christian, and Facebook counter-apologist extraordinaire. Welcome, Brady. Glad to be with you, Paul. I'll confess, I rarely watch counter-Christian videos because all my time is taken watching Christian videos. But every once in a while, one breaks through and I just have to watch. Even more rarely, there's a video that I wish I had made. And I'm telling you, my heart breaks that I didn't make Satan's Guide to the Bible. But I'll let YouTube pastor Mike Winger Describe it to you. There is a dangerous video gaining popularity called Satan's Guide to the Bible that illustrates a pretend children's Sunday school class learning from Satan as their substitute teacher. I like it already. He claims that pastors keep secrets from their congregants, but that, that he will reveal those secrets and tell them the truth. I'm here to reveal peacefully hidden Bible secrets. Bible secrets? None of us will believe your secrets. There are, of course, other witnesses to these Bible secrets. One of the witnesses everyone here trusts. Who? Your pastor. Pastor Mark knows these Bible secrets too? He does. Like lots of pastors, he learned a bunch of Bible secrets at seminary. And he won't share them with us? He's keeping secrets. This is great because this Satan character is doing the very thing the serpent did in the Garden of Eden, accusing the presumed good guy of keeping secrets. But what they go on to point out is that the serpent and Satan don't get conflated into the same character until much later in the evolution of the Bible's twisting narrative. It's like they're preparing you to think critically from the jump. So he's they're keeping them from you, but guess what? Don't worry, scholars, scholars, these, these objective, you know, really smart people who are only ever interested in truth, unlike every other human being who has a bunch of mixed motives and everything they do, uh, they're going to tell you the real truth. Every human being has mixed motives? Even Mike? Good to know. The anti-intellectualism from evangelicals never ceases to be depressing. Can you please analyze this video and refute its false claims about the Bible? It's interesting that this person is not asking if the claims are true. But whether or not Mike can take time to refute the claims that the questioner already knows are false. I guess if you're going to be hopelessly biased, you might as well announce it at the start. They'll tell us what Pastor Mark learned in seminary? They will. The biblical scholars will tell you the Bible secrets. Surprisingly, none of this is new to me. That's true there that this is this is known stuff. This is not new. But this is very much a, t a storytelling type of thing that's happening. The documentary doesn't claim that these things are new. The claim is that these things aren't shared with the average Christian, at least not until they're already so invested that it's almost too late to turn back. That narrative was very much part of my journey and why this video rings so powerfully for me and others. When I started learning about all these nuances and background facts that make the Bible seem more like a fully human book than a divine one, I ran to my pastor, my professors and they casually dismissed my surprise with Mike's blasé, yeah, we know, attitude. So why didn't they tell me? The responses were variations of, most people can't handle it, or it would cause doubt. And yeah, that's the point. I felt betrayed by leaders who were falsely and confidently misrepresenting the strength of their position. In a lot of areas of life, the cover-up 
is more damaging than the crime. That intellectual betrayal is a major reason I feel the responsibility to do what I currently do on this channel. Amen to all of that. They're using like Hector Avalos and Bart Ehrman, who are basically atheists and agnostics, effectively atheists in their beliefs about God, and others who would not be considered Christians by Christianity, by like, you know, Orthodox Christian values about believing in the death and resurrection of Christ, um, about believing basically in God. Sorry, Dale Allison. Mike Winger just revoked your invite to the Christian cookout. And so it's standard stuff. And really, we're just hiding it from the congregants. Pastors, people like myself, we're, we're hiding it from you guys. I'm sorry to keep chiming in, but this guy is just unbelievable. He's trying to make it seem like this depiction of how Christian leaders function is not believable. But just like you, Paul, I lived it. My experience was I learned most of these Bible secrets after seminary. And when I contacted one of my former professors, he informed me of how many other seminary graduates come back to him with the same story. And then he essentially told me, now that you know these things, Brady, if you can find a way to still believe, then you'll be a mature Christian. It was like he was welcoming me into a secret society that I wasn't sure I wanted to be a part of. They're teaching Bart stuff to everyone? Anyone who has gone at least through, I would say, a master's level would be well aware of every argument that Bart Ehrman has ever presented. It's standard stuff. And yet most pastors who've gone through that training don't tell their congregations what it is that they've learned. So you get the idea. It's standard stuff. Now, what's interesting is if you actually got, say, James White, who they quote as their source for its standard stuff in seminary, then he would have then told you, and so are the arguments against it. You see, the, these arguments aren't standard stuff that is uncontroversial amongst all scholars, right? I have thoughts, but let's let him say a bit more. The arguments against these things should also be standard stuff. If you're doing a robust educational environment in your seminary, then you're going to say, yeah, here's an argument against the book of Daniel. Here's one for it. Here's the two sides of the coin. Okay, this is actually a good point. Well, kind of. It's not that evangelical fundamentalist Christians don't have answers to these challenges presented in Satan's Guide to the Bible. Their answers are standard too. But then, so are the critical responses to those answers. And on and on it could go. It seems like Mike won't be happy until the entire ongoing conversation is reproduced by those looking to highlight that there's more to the story than what most pastors are letting on. But then... Why doesn't he complain that pastors are not giving both sides on Sunday morning? Why is he okay with their propaganda? Exactly. Mike and the other pastors could have completely stripped this cartoon Satan of his power by using their pulpit to acknowledge the existence of these scholarly controversies and whatever counterpoints they feel are pertinent, rather than just praying that their congregation remain blissfully ignorant of potential flaws. It's the historical lack of intellectual honesty in evangelicals that gave this YouTube Satan his power in the first place. I made you, you gotta say you made me. How childish you can get, huh? The book of Daniel, the authorship of the book of Daniel is very much a, an issue in question amongst scholars. There's a lot of a lot of scholars right now, currently, scholarly trends right now, that think the book of Daniel was written after much of the prophecies that it says will be our future. That it was written like second century AD, uh, BC, excuse me, uh, not, you know, back in the fifth, sixth century or sixth, seventh. Uh, that math ain't mathin. Hmm. I wonder how Daniel did it. By pretending to be someone living in the distant past, an author could predict the future. The book of Daniel, allegedly written by the great wise man of the sixth century BCE, BC me, was actually written in the judgment of almost all critical scholars, some 400 years later. What the fuck? Whoa, liar. If the book of Daniel was written 400 years later, then that would mean Daniel did not author the book of Daniel. You, 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 the irreverence that's there, like it's just it's throughout the video, the sarcasm, the mockery of Christianity, of Christian values, of Christian people, um, and of Christian scholarship. No! The mockery of all of those things is all there. It's extremely propaganda, propagandistic work, uh, 100%. Um, the, the, the Chinese government would approve. Someone alert Xi Jinping. This guy can't take a joke. 
Mike spends far more time tone policing and clutching at pearls than putting on big boy pants and just correcting any errors. And notice that Mike isn't actually pointing out any errors. He's merely pointing out that Christians have come up with excuses for why the true things that Satan is saying aren't a big deal. Just like in the Garden of Eden, Satan is correct. You are technically correct. The best kind of correct. I actually have my own video on the book of Daniel and the dating of Daniel, where I don't just say, um, all the scholars know this, dummies. You're all dummies because you don't know this. Duh, scholars know this. Pastors are hiding it. It's obviously a massive Christian conspiracy. <laughs> and I actually went and watched his video on the dating of Daniel. He does exactly what I said earlier. He presents the conservative Christian response to the critical scholarship, but then ends the discussion as if there is no critical response to the answers that conservatives give. There is an ongoing discussion, and the further you get into the details, you see the image in more relief, and you see how uncompelling the arguments for one side actually are. And I think the side that is less compelling is that of the conservative Bible scholar. He, he mentioned several times that we're not presenting the whole picture. You're not presenting the this and the that. And, you know, I think when it comes to, you know, well, we all like people already tend to believe this set over here. And so we only need to present like the new perspective. There isn't enough time to honor all of these things. An example, the book of Daniel, the authorship of the book of Daniel is very much a, an issue in question amongst scholars. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of. All right. So. Sorry, I keep laughing. Is, <laughs> is the authorship of the book of Daniel an open question among scholars? No. Yes. It, it, well, so nobody, we don't, we don't nobody know who the knows. author was. Yeah. Nobody knows. In terms of who it was, that's an open question. Right. Is authenticity, <laughs> unity? Nope. Date? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dave. We we are pretty I mean, secure on that. this. They, like, but this is this is really the crux, right? Because from what Mike means by this is, if there's one, right? right? If there's one evangelical scholar, right? That's the thing here. It's not like it's fifty percent and fifty percent. <laughs> no, it's like ninety eight percent and <laughs> you, Mike. Yeah, and and there you see this in a lot of commentaries, whether it's the the pastoral epistles or Daniel. It's not impossible. We have, and they'll say things like, we have good reason to think, or it's plausible, or something like that, where they, they just need that little tiny sliver of not impossible, because they're speaking to people who are already agree with them and just want to be made to feel like it's not impossible. So it's offering you a lie, a distortion of reality, to defeat your faith in Scripture. It's propaganda. That's the nature of Satan's Guide to the Bible here. So they select, you know, Bart Ehrman, who is well-known, at least amongst among certain circles that, that I'm in, uh, well-known for being somebody who tends to, when in, when in doing popular writings and in popular settings like this interview, he tends to say things in much stronger and exaggerated ways to make his claims seem more strong and even more scholarly solid than than uh, we would think they really are. Well, if somebody said, so my two books are Forged, which was a popular book, and Forgery and Counterforgery, and it was my long, very long scholarly book. If anybody can find any contradiction between those two books, I would love to know it. Nobody's ever pointed out one to me, and the claims are the same. Paul did not write the pastoral epistles. Paul almost certainly did not write Ephesians, Colossians. I mean, I know people say this about me, and it's an easy thing to say because you can take a quotation from one book and a quotation from another book and say they're not saying exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. That's true. One's scholarly, one's not scholarly. But if anybody knows any contradiction, I would love to hear it. The evangelical scholars, the ones who would be defending against the claims of Satan's guide to the Bible here, they are, their, their case is never presented. Sometimes claims from them are presented where they just say something, but their evidence or their case or their reasons for those claims are not presented. So it looks as though they're making sort of faith proclamations instead of actually providing their scholarship on an issue. We've addressed this unreasonable demand for equal airtime already. There's a place for that. I don't think that place is necessarily in videos like the one he's critiquing. As Paul said, the power in this video isn't some comprehensive debunking. It's the shock value of alerting Christians to controversies they've never heard of. Oh, this is the first I'm hearing of it. Pastors should have done a better job being open about this stuff in the first place. But when you go to the skeptic, when, they, when the skeptics are quoted, the airmen and the Avalos and these other guys, 
they they get claims and evidence. They're going to unpack their reasons and their evidence. And more often than not, in fact, almost in almost every case, they don't give any scholarly response against those claims. There's no pushback whatsoever, even when those claims are in the minority of scholarship, even though the video pretends they're in the majority. I sympathize with him to an extent here. He wants people to know both sides of the issue and how winsome his side is. Still, I cannot help but to think just how ineffective and irresponsible it is that if the biblical narrative is true and to be believed unto salvation, for whatever reason, the God in charge of it, whom I unaffectionately call Bible God, has left believers and unbelievers in this precarious situation where we must hear competing sides of arguments and then decide which is more compelling to us personally. And that is what our salvation will be based upon, convincing arguments and claims. Even if Mike turns out to be right in his defense of the Bible, this whole process is still very off-putting to me. But it's fitting that Satan's educating children in this video because that's effectively what they're doing to their audience is treating them as children who just have to be told facts and not any details. Uh, just trust me. Matthew 18, 3. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> I don't know how he missed that one. My God is not cool with killing innocent children for divine favors in battle. That may be, but the God of the Bible is. In the 11th chapter of the book of Judges, Jephthah, the leader of the Israelites, who are at war with the Ammonites, Moreites? from Canaan, wanting to secure victory for the Israelites, Jephthah makes a promise to God. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. The leader of the Israelites promises God he will set fire to whoever greets him first when he returns home from battle. He will uh, devote to the Lord the first thing he sees. But of course, it, it turns out to be his, his daughter his only child, and... Is that really what happened? <laughs> the question is, is this a moral flaw in the Bible? As in, is the Bible, the way that these amazing, totally objective, totally objective scholars who totally represent things your pastors all know, <laughs> sorry, it's just, it's ridiculous. Um, they present it as though God is cool, quote, cool with killing innocent children for divine favors in battle. I wondered if he was being a bit deceptive here. He's making the point that God is not cool with killing innocent children for divine favors in battle. See, it's the reason the children are being sacrificed that he's arguing against, not child sacrifice overall. He's worded it in such a way that if you press him with other scriptures where Bible God does seem to be okay with child sacrifices, Mike can always say, oh no, it was the reason Jephthah sacrificed his daughter that I was saying God wasn't cool with. But then Mike makes it clear. He doesn't think God is okay with child sacrifice at all. Is that true? The God of the Bible is cool with that. Uh, no, because Jephthah blew it. That's the thing. They, they show no text in scripture anywhere that suggests that God was favorable towards this, wanted Jephthah to do this, that it was okay in any way. Let me give you guys a number of reasons for this, because I know there's probably people watching right now who just think I'm the one offering propaganda. Me, 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 me. He's going to read a bunch of passages that make it seem like God is against human sacrifice, but he's going to skip over the ones that show God demanding it. Exactly. The charge isn't that the Christian Bible is consistently affirming of rape or genocide or slavery or child sacrifice. The charges of the Bible is inconsistent on these things. It seems that a perfect book from a perfect God would be perfectly consistent and unambiguous on the basics. It's interesting when people suggest that the Abraham and Isaac story is proof that God likes human sacrifice when God refuses to let it go through and says, no, no, here's a replacement instead. And then he tells all the Israelites, instead of having your, your son or your firstborn, you're going to offer an animal. I don't want human sacrifices. Then exp explicitly says in scripture, no, you're not allowed to do that. I hate that sort of thing. Um, in 2 Kings, we have uh, 21.6. 
We have kings, and this happens in multiple multiple cases, who were rebuked because leaders of Israel offered their children as sacrifices. Except Leviticus 27 has God telling the Israelites through Moses that there are some kinds of sacrificial vows that you make to God that can be redeemed, but there are other kinds that cannot be redeemed. In other words, if you vow to sacrifice a person to the Lord, you can change your mind and exchange that person for a price and offer the price of that person to the Lord instead. There is a price for people as old as 60 years of age, and a different, lesser price for people as young as five years old. However, the kind of vow that cannot be redeemed is the devoted offering. Verses 28 and 29 say, But no devoted thing that a man devotes to the Lord, of anything that he has, whether man or beast, or of his inherited field, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy to the Lord. No one devoted, who is to be devoted for destruction from mankind, shall be ransomed. He shall surely be put to death. Now, guess what kind of vow Jephthah made? This is why he could not renege and had to sacrifice his daughter, because he had made the kind of devoted offering vow of a human sacrifice that Bible God would not let him out of. Without my book, there are no morals. Is it going to be the word or is it going to be the world? Ah, you just watch. I might pull my book back, take it away from all of you animals. Then where will you be? 24-hour rape and anarchy is where you'll be. There are no morals, no comprehension Zeus you. of right and wrong without the Bible. The Bible is the ruler by which goodness is measured. Without the Bible, there is no right or wrong. Crossing my fingers and hoping he means the New Testament and not the Old. Then again, at least in the Old Testament, I could think about adultery and not be put to death. But according to Jesus in the New, if I even think it, I'm done for. The, the Christian position is presented as morality equals the Bible, which is a silly and nonsensical statement. The, um, the two different issues that are more real that Christians do bring up and should bring up and a right to bring up is that without God, number one, without not the Bible, but without God, there is no objective, real moral values and duties. I think that's 100% true. Um, how do we know what God's morality is if not for the Bible? I think that God is the best explanation for moral values and duties. And many, many atheists, even philosopher atheists, right? Even scholars, the scholars that that, that probably some scholars that, that this, the person who made this video would look up to would agree that if there is no God, there simply is no objective moral values and duties. I think I've heard you say this before, Paul. And if I'm right, I, like you, would agree with Mike that without God, there are no objective moral values and duties. But also, there are none with God. I mean, well... There may be moral duties with God, but God does not get us to objective moral values. The moral sentiments are still subjective. We've just switched the subject to God instead of us. The only way to have objective moral standards is if goodness exists on its own, out there, even outside of God. Exactly. Now, there's plenty of people who would say, no, 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 even without God, I still believe in morals. But yeah, of course you do. And I'm glad you do. And, and almost nobody lives that way because morals are sort of ingrained in us, I believe, by God. Ingrained in us by God? This sounds like Paul in Romans 2, where God's laws are written on the hearts of mankind. And because of that, we know and do what's right and also know when we're doing wrong. But I wonder, when other social animal species do what they consider to be right in their communities, does that mean that God's law is also written on their hearts? And when they do what their communities consider to be wrong, are they sinning? Did Jesus die for them too? But without the Bible, we wouldn't have our current culture carrying the same moral values and duties. And some call this stealing from God, where they say, well, you know, skeptic is stealing from God when they're going to use their moral values to judge, say, the Bible or something else, when really their moral values arose from Scripture. And <clears throat> and it, there's a truth in that, in that their, their societal awareness, their cultural sense of right and wrong is impacted hugely by scripture. An interesting book uh, on this is a book called Dominion 
by the historian Tom Holland, who talks about this. I've been dealing with this claim from Christians for a while, and Paul, if you'll permit me, I think this is a good place to plug the YouTuber Mr. Deity, who's been doing an excellent series in response to Tom Holland's book. His series is called Dumb Minion, Stop the Steal, and it's great. Did the Christians of the late 4th century bring us a world anything like we'd expect to see from an institution pregnant from its birth with the values of the Enlightenment? Is that what happened? <laughs> Not even slightly. That would take another 13 centuries, during which Christian Europe became the absolute opposite of anything even remotely enlightened. Free speech, freedom of expression, and free inquiry were as missing in action as a Christian practicing nonviolence and turning the other cheek. Mr. Deity often makes videos that I wish I had made. Dr. Allison, could you show us Bible verses where Jesus makes failed apocalyptic prophecies? Well, one is Mark 9-1, which says uh, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God has come with power. There be some of them that stand here. Standing where? Standing here. Zip it, Satan. Keep it down. Okay, what about us? Some of you shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Ooh, and what happened next? As would become something of a pattern for Christian people going forward, nothing happened. Nothing happened. <laughs> that's that's how it ends. So this this idea, though, that Jesus, uh, guess what? This is not new. This is, again, standard argument. They're right about that. I don't know. What happened next, they said? They said nothing happened. The scholar that they had says nothing happened. Well, verse 2, next thing that happened, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them, so some of those standing there, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no, no one on earth could have, could bleach them. So there's something supernatural about his appearance. So they go up to the mountain, and, and there's the transfiguration. Is it possible that that's what's being talked about? Well, it should at least be considered, right? It's the very next thing that happens in the text of Scripture. Them seeing Jesus transfigured is a pretty tame, dare I say, lame kingdom in light of what the actual promise was and what was the Jewish expectation. At best, this was a foreshadowing or a foretaste of the kingdom, but the promise was that the kingdom would actually come. So, either Jesus lied or Jesus was lied on because he never said this. For we did not follow Peter talking, clever, uh, cl cleverly devised Miz when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the kingdom of power coming and the Son of Man coming in power? What's he talking about? We were eyewitnesses of his majesty right there, that highlighted portion. When, when were they eyewitnesses? When did they see the kingdom of Christ coming in power? When he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I, well ple whom I am well pleased. I guess this is additional testimony and commentary on Mark 9. But does this, should this reinforce the interpretation that if Jesus did make that promise, he actually fulfilled it? Then he uses this in verse 19. You see he's using this. Hey, we saw the sample of the coming of, of the kingdom. And that's a confirmation. Of the, of the later coming of the kingdom. Notice how a sample of the kingdom becomes the fulfillment of the promise of the coming of the kingdom, all to help Jesus remain apocalyptically intact. So there's, there's you know, a, a sh very short case, not getting into all the details. They could have included this in the video, but it wouldn't work because then it wouldn't be Satan's mocking guide to the Bible where you're disproving everything in Christianity because they want it to look one-sided. <laughs> He's essentially saying, the nerve of these skeptics to not bend over backwards, breaking their necks to clean up the Bible's foibles. They want it to look like there's only one argument for their cause. All scholars agree. All the pastors secretly know it. And then you're just the children going, I guess I've been a dummy dum dum. And now I'm going to become a skeptic like you. And we can, we can, we can take over the internet with our atheism or something like that. We'll leave the light on for you. <laughs> the light of the enlightenment. But you know what's interesting? Satan's Guide to the Bible presents Jesus' non-fulfillment of his promise of apocalyptic return as the biggest Bible secret. And yet, Mike only deals with this one passage. He doesn't address the more embarrassing promise of Jesus in Mark 13. 
that this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. The documentary dives into this passage, but Mike doesn't touch it in his reaction. Satan's Guide to the Bible purports to be what all scholars know and pastors all know it, and then they do this empty tombs nonsense. The majority of scholars would disagree with the implication of this video that, that the empty tomb is not historical. Now, Bart Ehrman thinks it's not historical, a view he, he took on at some point in his career later on, not, not, not earlier on, um, after he was doing debates. And it seems to me that the empty tomb was a powerful debate point that his enemies would bring, his enemies in the debate, right? His, his opponents in the debate would bring saying, hey, evidence for the resurrection, the empty tomb is an important one. And then he later said, I don't believe that anymore. Here's Mike once again, poisoning the well by ascribing motive rather than taking someone at their word that upon further investigation, they've changed their mind on something. Mike, you've changed your mind on some issues, even in your time on YouTube. Should we talk about your motives for doing so rather than just looking at the arguments? Attributing motive is the least helpful thing you could be doing right now. The earliest discussion we have of the resurrection is provided by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. His argument is striking since he makes no mention of an empty tomb. Paul never mentions, not once, the empty tomb. Clearly, first thing you're thinking, the critical thinkers, you're going, Paul never mentions the empty tomb. Next thought, should I, ha should I expect Paul to mention it to think that he believed in it? It seems to me that there's a lot Paul doesn't mention about Jesus. Details about his birth, famous quotes and teachings, and details about his death and resurrection. There are two explanations for this. These things were either unimportant to Paul or they were unknown to him. And if they were unknown, it is either because these things were never told to him or these things never happened and were only invented as part of the narrative after Paul's time of influence. So Paul not mentioning the empty tomb is either a sign of its unimportance or it's a non-historicity. But the majority of scholars go back like 40 years. The majority of scholars were totally against the empty tomb. It was laughable if you tried to make a case for the empty tomb. While it doesn't help my case to point this out, Mike is simply wrong on this. At least according to de facto resurrection scholar champion Gary Habermas, he brags that his survey from 40 years ago had roughly 75% of scholars, of the kind he was willing to count, affirming an empty tomb. If it was ever laughable, it wasn't because it was a minority position. Scholarship has moved in a very different direction nowadays where the majority of scholars, even non-believers and skeptics and atheists and things like that, do believe the empty tomb is a reality. Wrong again. The reason scholars like Mike Lacona won't elevate empty tomb to the level of historical fact is precisely because it is not affirmed by non-believers or skeptics. By far, the majority of scholars who grant the empty tomb are Christian scholars. Um, and it doesn't come up to the level, even though it's a majority, if it's around 75%, that's a pretty strong majority. But I like it to be 90% or more for what I'm doing here, a nine, you know, for, for my criteria for accepting something as historical bedrock. So it didn't quite make a strong enough majority, and it certainly not a robust hetero, heterogeneity of scholarship um, that is granting it. It's for the Bible tells me so. Since most scholars in the field work for institutions that require them to sign a statement of faith that the Bible is inerrant, having a modest majority is unsurprising and unimpressive. It's rare to find someone who makes Gary Habermas seem modest and measured, but Mike has done it. The, there's things like Tel Ilan and, and her work um, uh, in Israel, the the discoveries of, um, I'm sorry, I think I got the scholar's name wrong, not Tel Ilan. She did the, the names, Palestinian names. Who was the, the tomb stuff? She's over at um, Bart Ehrman's university too, same, same school. Anyway, I have this in my empty tomb video. It's linked down below. You can check it all out. Jody Magnus. You're talking about Dr. Jody Magnus. She's been a guest here on my channel. You can check that out. You are oft quoted. Yeah, I, I look, so I just want to clarify. When I say they're consistent with, they are consistent with. Does that prove the historicity of the gospel accounts? It doesn't prove that the accounts are historical, but it means that wh whoever wrote those accounts was familiar 
with how the Jews of Jerusalem disposed of their dead in the time of Jesus. First Corinthians 15. This is the passage that they're like, hey, Paul didn't, didn't seem to even know about the empty tomb, right? Never wrote about it. You're putting words in Satan's mouth, Mike. His claim was merely that Paul didn't mention the empty tomb. Well, this is what he did, right? Let's just read it. I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. It's silly to think that this is evidence Paul didn't know about the tomb. He was, he died, he was buried, he rose. Does burial require a tomb? No, it could require just a hole in the ground. But is it consistent with the tomb? Yeah. Okay, so once again, Satan was right here. And Mike is left scrambling with excuses. Apostle Paul mentions burial, which Mike admits does not necessarily mean a stone-cut tomb that people would have known the location of. Paul doesn't say tomb, and he doesn't say empty tomb. Paul's account is consistent with the empty tomb narrative, sure, but it is equally consistent with Jesus being dumped in a forgotten hole and the empty tomb narrative being a legend that developed after Paul died. That's the point here. Paul is silent on all matters tomb-related. We have no idea if he believed it or not. Normal is history. You would just assume Paul's talking about the empty tomb here. But skeptical, you know, propaganda, you're going to be like, no, no, I'm going to make it so hard for you to prove any element of your Christian faith that I will fight you tooth and nail every step of the way. It's not fighting tooth and nail at every step of the way. If the gospel authors would have had Jesus buried in some obscure place, like Paul did, with no fact-checkable details, it would be unremarkable. But they didn't. They put a Roman soldier at the guard and ginned up a story about these Roman soldiers saying that they had been bribed to leave their post, and that's why the body went missing. So scholars and skeptics aren't nitpicking. We're asking how plausible this all is as history versus how much it seems like fiction or revisionist history. In the end, the Satan's Guide to the Bible is 100% a propaganda piece. It's a propaganda piece. It's a propaganda piece. Isn't one of the hallmarks of propaganda the repetition of assertions? It's a propaganda piece. It's a propaganda piece. But the Bible has been proven true many, many times. The prophetic statements in the scripture and their fulfillment um, later on in history are a very powerful piece of evidence. The unity of the scripture is a very powerful piece of evidence. And hopefully your own relationship and experiences with God are also a very powerful piece of evidence, at least for you, even if it's hard to communicate that to somebody else. It's funny because the failed prophecy, the non-historicity, and the disunity or non-univocal character of the Bible are the very reasons why I'm not a Christian today. More I could talk about, but that's, the, that's Satan's guide to the Bible. Um, I, that's my shortest way I can answer that, and it was much longer than I wanted it to be. And this is much longer than I wanted this to be. But here we are. Brady, thank you so much for joining me today. It was my pleasure, Paul. If you haven't already, you must immediately go check out Brady's criminally undersubscribed YouTube channel called Ichabod. I consider him to be an intellectual brother in Christ, or against Christ, I suppose. If you like my content, but wish it was much cooler, more thoughtful, and more eloquent, run and check out Ichabod. Links in the description, of course. And also check out Satan's Guide to the Bible if you haven't already, and put that in front of your favorite Sunday School student. Thanks for watching, and until next time, later.